As the economic crisis deepens, people have begun to question some of their preconceptions about capitalism. But people have questioned capitalism before. What keeps people from radically challenging our economic order? Why do we consent to the rule of capital? Why do we consent to our own exploitation? This video seeks to offer some insights into the origin of consent in a capitalist society. In a capitalist society, the social relations between people as they produce things take the form of market exchanges, of commodities which are exchanged for money. Thus, we often get the impression that money or commodities are in the driver's seat, that money is what rules the world, or that commodities have value and social influence all by themselves. And it's true that money and commodities express value and social power, but this value and this social power comes from somewhere else, from the basic social relations that lay behind the market exchange, the social relations between people as they produce things. And this should be the starting point for any truly radical social theory. If we understand that economic orders are not magical, that they aren't endowed with mystical powers or God-given impermanence, but that economies are social relations of our own creation. If we understand that, then we've already taken the first step toward figuring out how to change the world. But this is precisely the opposite of the way we experience capitalism. We experience capitalism in atomized form, each of us an isolated individual wandering through a world of blind, impersonal market forces that act upon us. Though we may not like the state of affairs in the world, we don't engage in actions to change them. Our freedom to act upon the world and change it is restricted to the realm of market freedoms, the freedom to choose which commodities to buy and which capitalists to sell our labor to. We don't have the freedom to not choose these things. We can't not buy commodities or not sell our labor to a capitalist. We can choose the specific content of our market interaction, but we cannot choose the form itself. The commodity is the basic form for the way we exchange the products of labor, and wage labor is the basic form by which workers enter production. This is the limit of bourgeois freedoms. We can choose the specific content of our consuming and producing, but we can't change the basic forms. Libertarians bask in the glory of bourgeois freedom. For them, bourgeois freedom serves to end all discussion of the social relations of capitalism. If I choose to go to work, the libertarian argument goes, then I am consenting to wage labor, which somehow legitimates capitalism relative to all other economic systems. Thus their argument becomes, capitalism exists because people choose it in their market interactions. But this is circular reasoning. Market interactions can only express capitalist outcomes. You can't choose a non-capitalist world through the market. Affecting some sort of anti-capitalist movement requires actions that go beyond these bourgeois freedoms, actions that transcend the market behavior of isolated individuals. It should be no surprise that whenever we see workers organizing to form a union or community groups organizing to control development, Libertarians complain that these collective projects for collective freedoms are distorting the market and attacking our essential freedoms as individuals. We are free to sing Lee Greenwood songs and make vague speeches about freedom all day long. But as soon as we question the market or private property, we come up against the coercive arm of the state. Our vast legal and prison systems and the extensive imperial overreach of the capitalist military form a powerful defense around the sacrosanct private property of the capitalist class. We are free to challenge a lot of things in the capitalist world, but private property forms the border around those freedoms. The state will spare no violence in the defense of private property. Every social order has a limit a horizon beyond which things cannot be questioned. And this limit is usually enforced by some sort of violent, coercive arm. Feudal Europe had a class of knights that ensured the obedience of the peasant classes. A capitalist society has a state, with its legal system, police, and military to protect private property, impose order upon markets, and maintain the integrity of the currency. Yet this coercive nature is clearly not enough to help us understand the question at hand. No matter how much theory may expose the exploitative basis of wage labor, 
or the brutal realities of capitalist development, we must face the fact that most of us freely consent to our lot as wage laborers, that our everyday lives do not compel us forward toward some final confrontation with capital, but instead acclimate us to not think out of the box, to not question the social order. Often, the longer we work, the more habituated we become to wage labor. Why is this? Why do we consent to our own exploitation? Many people try to answer this question by discussing the way ideology is imposed upon us. The basic idea in such arguments is that through the airwaves, television, schools, and newspapers, we are being inundated with brainwashing propaganda designed to make us happy workers, devoted consumers, and mindless drones. It's not hard to come by such conclusions when we look at the sheer volume of advertising we absorb daily, all devoted to this cause. It's not hard to see how the structure of capitalist media ownership selects media in a way that reinforces its own view of the world. As helpful as this view of ideology may be, it's not the whole picture. It makes ideology look like it is something entirely imposed from above. It makes consent look like something stamped upon unthinking, unintelligent lemmings. The reality is that consent and ideology spring out of the basic structure of the market itself, and that they would exist with or without televisions, billboards, or schools. We've already seen how the basic structure of the market, free exchange between formerly equal individuals, creates the appearance of freedom and equality. This world of market freedom and equality masks a world of coercion and inequality in the sphere of property and production. After all, why does a worker need to enter the marketplace to purchase their means of subsistence in the first place? Because they don't have the ability to produce it themselves. And why does a worker enter the market to sell her working life to the capitalist class? Because she does not own any means of producing commodities herself. Thus, the very fact that a worker enters the market to buy commodities and sell wage labor implies that there is an asymmetry in the ownership of production. But we don't see this in the marketplace. All we see is formerly equal people exchanging commodities. Nobody is forcing anyone to buy or sell anything. Thus, market exchange itself obscures the coercive asymmetry behind the market. The market obscures the source of profit as well. The workers create more value than their wages. The capitalist doesn't receive this value until these commodities are sold in the market. At the end of the working day, the worker leaves with a wage, and the capitalist leaves with a bundle of commodities worth more than their initial investment. But these commodities must be turned into money in order for the capitalist to complete this process. In the market, anything could happen. The capitalist could end up selling those commodities above or below their values. Thus, the market appears as the source of profit. The creation of surplus value in production through exploiting workers is hidden from view. Of course, these market prices are the result of the total social productivity of labor, but we can't see the total social productivity of labor. All we see is market prices. And so the market itself, the act of exchange itself, appears to create value. Bourgeois economic theory mirrors this world of appearance perfectly. It sees profit emerging from the process of exchange itself. It ignores the wider social relations of production. It ignores the way the total social productivity of labor affects market prices and market behavior. It treats the isolated free act of exchange in the market as the only interaction worth analyzing. It then deduces that all economic phenomena must be able to be explained through that isolated interaction without recourse to any wider picture of social relations. And this is the way ideology really works. It's not imposed from above. It grows naturally out of the basic structure of this world of appearances. We don't even need newspapers or televisions or schools to brainwash us into obeying the social order. We develop these ideas freely through our daily journeys through this world of appearance. There's a contradiction between the world of appearance and the social relations behind it. We live in a world of freedom in which none of us are free, a world of formal equality filled with barbaric inequalities. This is not just some illusion imposed upon reality from some conspiratorial elite on high. The coercive and unequal social relations of capitalism can only be expressed through the freedoms of the marketplace. The social antagonisms of capitalism can only be experienced as bourgeois freedoms. <laughs>